Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. It is almost like the whole world has forgotten the massive panic attack that shot all economies in the foot, which was our reaction uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, as we look back on those days, today we don't see any effort being made to hold any of the individuals that pushed the lockdown shutdown agenda that destroyed our economy being held accountable. Yes, lockdowns and shutdowns were necessary at the height of the pandemic to a certain extent. Still, unnecessary shutdowns that occurred due to fear-mongering, now that's not at all acceptable. Those were the ones that contributed to the destruction and quick demise of our economy. It is that same thinking from the so-called economists who are dictating how we as a country should recover from the current crisis situation. The same Colombo liberal idiot class. The interesting thing, however, is that the political parties that was against these neoliberal policies or the ones who appear to be against these policies are the ones who are now backing the president to implement all of this, suggesting that the country has no other recourse other than the prescription of the IMF, which is a false narrative. Here's something interesting. Listen to the president of Ireland, President Michael D. Higgins, who delivers a scathing critique of neoliberal economics, especially concerning the obsession with austerity. Watch. And given the dominance of neoliberalism as a paradigm for over four decades, it is highly surprising that the global influence of the economic right ensured that economic orthodoxies shaped the thinking of those responsible for the making of Irish public policy across all areas. The inherent flaws and limits of the neoliberal paradigm have now not only been exposed but laid bare for all to see, and but they are acknowledged particularly in the wake of austerity responses to the global economic crisis of 2008-9 that is and a set of responses that has proved so socially ruinous in many parts of, of Europe. The bad economics at the source of that response, those responses was based on a fallacy of description, an obsession with descriptive economic analysis and quantification of metrics, including a completely <coughs> meaningless use of gross domestic product that was championed at the expense of deeper analysis with the theoretical adequacy. It was bad economics. Well, that was the president of Ireland, uh, President Michael D. Higgins. Let's get more context uh, on this story. And for that, uh, joining me now from Sydney, Australia, via Zoom, is Professor Gigi Foster from the University of New South Wales. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, now, recently, uh, you commented that the inflation rise in Australia is due to Aaron Year's COVID policies implemented during the pandemic season. Now, is this something, uh, Professor, you see only in Australia, or is it seen all across the globe? Thanks for the question, Mayesh. Um, yeah, it is definitely seen across the globe. I will certainly say in my country of origin, the United States, we've seen the same kind of pattern where central banks have had to hike up their uh, base rates, their cash rates, quite significantly, quite substantially relative to historical standards after having kept those rates very, very low during the COVID period, even though it was known that there was an inflationary environment being created, or certainly it was, would have been known by anybody who studied macroeconomics, when you pause the economic activity of a nation and you inject a huge amount of cash, then you are creating an international, uh, sort of potentially around the world, a kind of inflationary environment. So that's definitely a problem, and it's something that the central banks uh, around the world have been struggling to um, basically respond to now, ex post, a little bit late. And certainly we've seen inflation here in Australia, we've seen inflation in the United States, in Europe. Uh, it's a huge problem that uh, the West has really not gotten a handle on yet, because not only are the central banks, uh, you know, kind of behind the eight ball on all of this, but we've also had many other effects of the COVID policy disaster, such as the closure of ports and other kinds of ways of interrupting business, which have created supply chain snarls, which are still being worked out. So those snarls create actual real inflation. And then on top of that, you have the monetary problems that the central bank is trying to fix. So it's a, it's a real mess at the moment. And I feel for central banks around the world, but unfortunately this is the, the consequence of our mismanagement during COVID, which some of us were uh, really trying to avoid with our speeches and, and our, our commentary, but uh, unfortunately we didn't win the day. 
Absolutely. And uh, Professor, not only in Sri Lanka or Australia, but worldwide, uh, you don't see these uh, established financial institutions like the IMF or the World Bank doing their part to bring down costs and make living tolerable for the people all around the world. So if this is the trend where world leaders are not bothered to bring uh, inflation down, cut costs and strength, uh, strengthen the middle income class, what are we to expect in the next few years? Yeah, Mayesh, it's a great question. So one of the big problems of the modern age is a lack of accountability of the elite, and that includes the, the globalist elite and the elite in different nations to the people. So the notion that somehow these institutions that are being led by the, uh, you know, the, the, the top of the IMF, the top of the World Bank, the, the nation, national leaders in various countries should somehow be in service to the populations that that's kind of gone out of fashion. And we now see that those elites have been carried away a bit with their own power and their own success, which skyrocketed during the COVID period. And as you know, power is a hard drug. People get corrupted with power. And if there's no accountability mechanism, and there isn't really in, in respect of the performance of, for example, the elites heading the IMF and the World Bank and many of the government bureaucracies as well, there's no accountability mechanism, then you should expect as a political scientist that those people are going to stray from their initial mission. So I think it's a real problem that uh, we, we have to reckon with in the way that we think about reform coming out of the COVID era. We need reform ideas that are going to return power, transparency, and accountability to the people. Uh, to our political systems and to our international systems as well. So I would say there, there is a big problem. And if you want to read more about this, I've written many blogs about this kind of issue with my co-authors on the Great COVID Panic behind me on the Brownstone Institute site. Go to brownstone.org and you just look up my name. You can find many um, musings about the, the issues we have right now with the betrayal of the people by people in power that is the elites during the COVID period, which was happening even before that period, but has really reached a horrible nadir during this period. And it brings to the fore the need to restore democracy and not just having elections, but uh, many other kinds of reforms as well that, that will actually uh, create more direct voice for populations in the policy settings and the resource allocation decision making that that uh, happens every day in countries that should be on the behalf of the people, not on behalf of just the, the land rich elite. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Professor, uh, now Sri Lanka's economic crisis, uh, something that you know, uh, and the solutions applied are not giving us the upper hand in dealing with our affairs as we move on. Now, if you are advising our leaders what would you advocate on behalf of the Sri Lankan people? Well, I would love to see a, an implementation of a democratic reform in the, in the lines of what I just spoke about. And uh, one example of an idea of how to do that would be to establish a citizen jury system such that the heads of various public service entities in Sri Lanka were appointed not by politicians, but directly by people. You establish a jury role, as you do already for civil and criminal cases, and people, anybody who is a citizen of Sri Lanka appears on that role when they reach of age. And then those people potentially get called up in expectation once in their lifetime to serve for, say, two or three months uh, with a jury of their peers for, say, 20 maybe peers or so. And they look exclusively at the problem of who should be appointed as the next, let's say, minister of education or the next minister of health. And that then puts in place a person who is responsible to the people much more than many of the people at the moment are uh, actually responsive, then, you know, compared to what we have now, where basically the entire set of ministries in many countries, including Sri Lanka, including Australia, are much more um, uh, sort of privileging the benefits of elites rather than the benefits that, that could be had by their populations. And so the idea is gradually over time, we would replace the tops of the public service, the tops of all publicly funded entities with a cadre of people who are directly responsible to the population rather than responsible to the politicians. And that would be a great start for Sri Lanka, for Australia. Uh, and of course, it's going to be resisted by the elites in charge because it makes them less powerful and it makes them less able to advance their cause. But, you know, that's just tough cookies. <laughs> if it's a democratic country, this is a reasonable reform to ask for. Indeed, uh, I wish I had more time uh, to keep this discussion going on, but uh, we have to leave it at that. That was Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales, Australia, Professor Chichi Foster. Thank you very much. Let's take a short commercial break. Upon our return, we will speak to Professor Jami Maudud from Sarah Lawrence College in New York, USA. 
This is the State of the Nation, back in a moment.